Hello, I'm Robin Vincent and welcome to Molten Music Technology. Today, I'm looking at the Analog Solutions Impulse Command. It's a monosynth, a semi-modular analog monosynth with dual dynamic oscillators and dual filters. It's got dual envelopes, dual LFOs, and a bit of a sequencer weirdo thing in it as well. We see a lot of mono synth, semi-modular type synthesizers about these days, but nothing quite like this. Or at least I haven't come across anything quite like it. On the surface, you think it has all the regular sort of subtractive synthesis kind of things. It's got oscillators, it's got filters, it's got pulse width modulation, LFOs, envelopes, all the usual bits and pieces. But the weird thing or the strangely awesome thing about this particular synthesizer is the way these things work together. It's like there's a lot of creative decisions have gone on behind the scenes in the way things route, in the way the signal path goes, in the way things modulate each other. And the result of that is you get this kind of wildly dynamic experience. Now, most of this is found in the filters, these dual filters. Having two filters, yeah, that's nice. Two filters, that's good. You can do two things at once. But what's interesting here is that it focuses on your stereo field. So it throws one filter over one side, one filter over the other. And that kind of starts creating this illusion that you've got far more than one thing going on. And you have, I think, have got far more than one thing going on. So what I'm going to attempt to do in this video is kind of take you through it, through the oscillators, through the filters, through the modulation, and then through the sequencer it has at the bottom. And hopefully I'll be able to show what it is that sets this apart from a lot of other monosynths and perhaps why you should give it some of your attention. So first of all, the build quality, while it's a big thumping wedge of a synthesizer, look at the state of that, this solid single piece front panel built onto this red base is just lovely and secure and sorted. It's angled in a slight console way, all of the knobs are nice and something you probably can't see because of the lights in here is this wonderful spilling of light out the side maybe if i turn that off you'll be able to see that a bit better spot that and so on the desktop it feels like a proper piece of gear all of the knobs are good there's no wobble or weirdness going on everything feels good which is what you want for a synthesizer of this sort of caliber so let's get some sound out. Well, what I've discovered is that there's no actual drone mode. You can't just turn it on and have it make sound as such. You need to have something going on. Now that can either be from a MIDI keyboard, it can be from control voltage coming in, or it can be with its own sequencer here, which is probably the easiest way because that's an internal thing. To get that running, you turn the sequencer synchro knob to LFO2. And there you have it. And then this little sequence that's going along here at the bottom, it's not doing anything to do with pitch because it has nothing to do with pitch, or at least not directly. And then you can speed that up or slow that down. With LFO number two. Now you can also route MIDI clock in here or clock from CV or something like that in order to run the sequence. But whenever the sequence is running, it's always firing the envelopes and that will always give us that note. So our choices of just to listen to the oscillators is either for me to hit a keyboard all the time, which I can do, or to hold down for an arpeggiator. That's quite interesting or to run the internal thing, which is just going beep, 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 beep. But what we can do with a little bit of manipulation of the envelope, we can kind of push it into sort of droneness so that we can appreciate how the oscillator works. Because that's always a good starting point, I think. So let's do that. Turn that on. If I turn the release up, it starts turning into a bit of a drone. So there we are, that's the sawtooth wave. All we've got at the moment running is oscillator one. Oscillator one on sawtooth, that's it. This has four different waveforms. We've also got a sine, which is quite sedate. We've got a square wave. And then we've got some noise. 
So those are our basic building blocks. To that, we can bring in the second oscillator. As you can hear, the second oscillator really thickens up that sound. It wants to do it. It's not trying to be a precise second oscillator to give you, you know, just a little bit of something extra. It's trying to fight with it. It wants to fight with it. It wants to interlock and phase and do weird stuff. That's what it's all about, that second oscillator. And then further to that, I can add in a sub. Mm -hmm. Oh. Now the second oscillator and the sub are both square waves and there's some pulse width modulation which you can start to bring in. And that's also tied to LFO2. Now that is quite something, I think. Translate it to the keyboard. about the oscillator section is wanting to crash into each other. It's not wanting to be well behaved, it's not wanting to be nice or pleasant. Oscillator 2 just wants to mess the heck out of the first oscillator. But you know if you pull things back, if you pull things out, 
then you get this lovely pure tone of the first oscillator or actually the pure tone of the sub. Those two are very nice. Once you introduce the oscillator number two, it just starts to try to rip holes in the space-time continuum, or, you know, or some such. So that's nice. That's the oscillator one and sub doing, you know, the usual things that one would expect. Bring in oscillator two. <laughs> and it just rips the heck out of it. I mean, in a fabulous way. I'm not saying that that's, oh, that's awful. No, not at all. The exact opposite. You bring that pulse width in. Oh, it's like treacle. <laughs> Just lovely. But within the oscillator section, it's not done yet. It has this weird way of mixing waveforms. There's no sort of traditional mixer like you generally expect to find. And what I'm actually doing is I'm affecting the when I'm bringing in the oscillator to and bringing in the sub, I'm pushing up the what's called the initial level because once that's fired, once that's started, then there's something else which takes control of oscillator two and the sub. And that, in the case of oscillator two, is either MIDI velocity or envelope number one, and with the sub, it's just velocity. So, what we could do is bring down the level on both the sub and oscillator two. So that's just mostly oscillator one I'm getting. But as I hit harder, oscillator two and the sub should start to emerge, I think. Which is very interesting. I don't think I've come across that before, at least recently on what would normally think of as a simple monosynth. And so that sort of brings together an extra level of possibility, particularly when dealing with MIDI. And one of the interesting things I've discovered in playing with this synth is that it loves MIDI. It really likes MIDI keyboards. Again, that's a bit unusual because with your monosynths like your No Coast or your Mother 32 or your Rebus or your Microvolt or your other bits and pieces, they really encourage you to use control voltage. That's what they want you to do. They want you to be bringing in stuff from modular and other bits and pieces. Yeah, sure, they might have a MIDI input, but that's not really been their focus. Whereas with the impulse command, it loves a bit of MIDI. It does weird things with MIDI. And you find that when you play it from a keyboard, it gives a completely different vibe to have it running on the sequencer or from something else. So that's very interesting. I have to keep going backwards and forwards to the keyboard just to remind myself of how different it is. And things like mapping MIDI velocity to certain amounts of modulation or level is a very interesting way of using that connection. Right, so the oscillators are a playground all by themselves. And that is actually fascinating just on its own. You can play with that for hours, just messing that.
course, there comes a time where we have to move on to those filters because it likes the filters. The filters are what everything is all about. So let's get a bit of a drone going again and check out the kind of filter craziness. So let's start off with our basic first oscillator sawtooth. And bring that filter in. Now, at this point, I need to stress that you need to be listening to this in stereo because the filter is all about the stereo field. You have one filter which is placing itself over on the right side and one filter placing itself on the left side. That's very important. And that is what creates this weird sense of more than one thing going on, of different tunes, of different melodies and all sorts of stuff going on at once from a single monosynth. So what you get here, you get the big fat cut off. Now this is VCF left, assuming I've got my wiring round the right way. Doesn't really matter, just as long as you know one side from the other. But attached to that is another filter, another filter which is offset to it, an offset which is set by this knob here. And so you get, on the left channel, one thing going on, on the right channel, something else. Now as you move the big knob, the other one travels with it. Because you're setting the offset to it with the other knob. You're not setting its own cutoff frequency, you're setting how far away it is from the original. So as the original moves, that moves with it. Does that make sense? Because it sounds like you have a filter opening and then another one following it behind, which is what you do have because of the offset. So you have the offset running around behind. push the resonance even further. And you kind of get into AM radio territory. Let's take a moment and revel in the glory of the dual analog filters. I've got a scope set up here. I'm gonna run the output from here through here and it should show us the left and right filter peaks. That's the plan. So this is our fundamental. It's just got a sine wave going through at the moment. And if we bring up the resonance, we should see our left hand peak with this cutoff. With this cutoff, there's the right hand one. And as I move this one, you'll see them move together because this is an offset of that one. I'll make it into a more interesting wave, then the filtering will be a bit more interesting as well.
Now, of course, that's all on a drone. Now let's stick uh, some kind of arpeggiator through it again and see what we get with that. Now, of course, there's tons of modulation to be had. So, for instance, I could allocate an envelope to the first cutoff very easily, just down here. Envelope one, level. Now, the important thing to know is that that cutoff is now being affected by the envelope, but it's not affecting the second cutoff. Well, it is a little bit, but that's still there doing its own thing. But I could, of course, set the second one to the same. Or maybe I'll set it to the second envelope. Or perhaps the LFOs. Nice. Now you can also set MIDI velocity to affect the, the level of the cutoff as well. So you've got that dynamicism coming in from your playing of a keyboard, which is this MIDI love affair again, sneaking in. You've also got this rather interesting aggro knob. Now what that does is cross modulates the filter cutoff with oscillator number two. What does that sound like? A bit like this. Oh yes! Oh! 
lovely. So that's the filter section, but that's only it running by itself, mostly manually, because there's this whole thing down here called the, the sequencer. I'm not so sure about that name, but the idea is you've got an analog step sequencer here, which is really, in all honesty, devoted to modulation, modulating these two filters differently. And that creates a whole thing. It kind of uses the cutoff to create melodies within itself differently in different ways. Let me show you. So we have our sequence running on our LFO2 here. It fires the envelope so we get this pulsing of our oscillator. No pitch information. I'm not taking anything in from the keyboard at the moment. But what I can do is I can send some of this to filter number one and I can start putting in bits. Then I can also send that to filter two. start feeding it some pitch information. But at this point, what we'd like to do is move beyond this single note. <laughs> I'm changing pitches on here. I mean, I can send an arpeggiator in in order to change the pitch, but then that's not going to be in time with what the sequencer is doing necessarily. So we want to do something which is going to take care of that. And to sort that out, Analog Solutions have built in a nice little MIDI loop sequencer. Now we saw this in the Treadstone synth. In the Treadstone, you played a few notes and it would uh, loop round. This does exactly the same thing. And it ties itself nice to the little step sequencer at the bottom. So to do it, you just hit this red button here that says run, stop, I think, I don't know, something to do with the MIDI loop sequencer. Then you can play a bunch of notes. And with a bit of luck, that will now be stuck in here. And now this introduces another very, very cool feature, which is called the reorder knob. The reorder knob changes the way the sequencer is ordering itself. Not randomly, it does it in a certain particular way. So as I turn it, you'll be able to see these are changing.
And you'll notice that it doesn't just redo the pattern, it does it from wherever it currently is. So it changes it from where your current position is, as opposed to just jumping to the same notes every time. I can also transpose of this little button here. So just having a recap at the moment, you've got two oscillators and a sub which fight each other beautifully. You've got this dual analog filter system which is throwing itself about all over your stereo field, offset to one another, moving with each other and then moving against each other once you've got modulation involved. You've got this sequencer sizer thing down the bottom here which is throwing CV into the filter in different ways and creating its own melodies with the cutoff peaks. And at the same time, you can modulate the filter with the LFOs or with the envelopes or with MIDI velocity coming in. So there's shed loads of stuff going on. Meanwhile, the pitch information is coming via MIDI from a keyboard or from a MIDI loop sequence. And that's working independently, although also tied into the same things. And so when you start reordering the sequence, it's reordering the notes as well as the modulation, all at the same time. There's a whole other thing we haven't talked about yet, and that's this weird internal patch system. Now it is here, it's called patch, internal patching. And the manual doesn't really tell you much about it other than it's a mysterious place for adventure. And I've even spoken to Tom from Analog Solutions and he says, no, I'm not telling you what's in there. <laughs> You've just got to go with it. And that is, I think, the essence of this synth. You kind of have to go with it because you can sit here and purposely do things as I've kind of been doing during this demo so far. And that is not really where the adventure lies. The adventure lies in messing about, in moving things about and going with what it's doing and then moving something else and then changing something else. It's in the discovery and the pathways and the adventure that this synthesizer comes alive. Not in deliberate, I'm gonna to try to filter this now. No, it's not really that interested in that. It wants you to modulate the heck out of stuff. It wants you to push this over here and that over there. It wants those oscillators to clash with each other and to start fizzing and to cross modulate the aggro into the filter, to have that stuff going on. And then it wants you to wander off down this mysterious lane of the internal patch on this knob here. So what does it do? Well, I don't know, let's start something going again and I'll try to show you. Wow. 
wow. <laughs> Or we could just stay on this for a bit. See, that's something that I love, that you just discover something else. I mean, I only turn something off and on again, I think. And now I've got this fatness going on, and I've got these knobs here are creating this rhythm. And it's percussive, it's a, it's a bashing of stuff going on within here. Well, uh, let's start here and start filling with that patch knob. So what it does is change the internal routing somehow. See, that's what had changed. What had changed is that I'd moved the patch knob before I turned it back on again. That's why we were getting something extraordinarily different. So this is where we were to start with. And that's all right. If I move it round, something else will happen. Now that one is a bit of a dropping away. It's like it's removed something from the signal chain. Keep going. Then it starts bringing in the envelopes, I think, to the filters. And here it's starting to bring noise and grit in. Oh, there's something else going on there. So there's something going on, it's, it's usually to do with the routing, it's usually to do with what oscillators are playing and how those are connected together. Now what's interesting of course, is that you can wire this to your sequencer sizer down here at the bottom. So I can turn up the patch send here. And it's now changing the internal patching on these knobs. And that creates some interesting percussion. And this is of course without any pitch information going in. 
There's no melody going in. yet we haven't added any effects Thank <laughs> you. 
So are we done yet? No, no, we're not done yet. <laughs> there is the patch bay. There's a patch bay. So that reveals a number of uh, ins and outputs that we haven't used up to now. It's not comprehensive. There's not a whole load of stuff there, but you do get inputs on the picture of the CV. You get inputs to the cutoff of both of them and the clock and triggering the envelope. You get the envelopes out, you get LFO1 out as a triangle and LFO2 as a square wave, which you don't have anywhere else in the system. So you can use that square wave and stuff it into something else if you like. But probably the most remarkable thing in the patch bay is that you get a pitch input on oscillator two. So if you put something into oscillator one and it will it'll do that. So for instance, if I take off the MIDI sequencer loop, I can take the CV output, which is coming from the sequencer, plug that into both oscillators, and we're gonna get the same tune being played on the oscillator as you're getting played on the filter, if that makes sense. I'm not sure if any of this will make sense when I start it up again. Let's just see what happens. So this sequencer here is now acting as an analog step sequencer into the pitch. And I can increase the amount I'm doing that, which is increasing the range of those tones. Now what's interesting is I can put that just into oscillator two. That's interesting. 
So I've still got the sub and I've got the main oscillator just running on a single note. And I've got oscillator 2 doing its own thing. Then I can bring the MIDI sequencer back in. Now I've got two things competing, I think. Take the output of oscillator one and stick that into oscillator two. It's also really important to keep coming back to your MIDI keyboard because you might find something different and interesting.
that'll probably do it, I think. There's obviously a lot more you can do with the patching. You can make your sequence sizer thing run other modules. You can bring other modules in. There's also an audio input, so you can run that through the dual filters just to play with the dual filters, which is an absolute joy by itself. But I think somewhere in there, I've given a half decent overview of what is possible with this thing. And what I love about it is that it, it just pulls you off into little adventures and you come back and you play some more. And then you go on the keyboard and go, oh. That's unexpectedly nice. Let's play with that for a bit. And then you play with that. I mean, there's, there's stuff perhaps which is missing. There's not a whole lot you can do with patching. One of the things that I would really like to do is to sort of disengage the envelopes from the sequencer so that the sequencer can just run modulation. So I can hit a note and the sequencer is running and running all those different bits of modulation. Whereas at the moment, as long as the sequencer is running, it's playing a note all the time, playing a note, whatever note was last played, it continues to gate and envelope that note. And that's cool and stuff. I would just like the option not to, so that I can play with that a little bit more. The effects are, are a little bit hit and miss. You'll not necessarily understand what it is that you've found. I mean, there's a flanger in there. There's some different types of reverbs and different types of delay. But as it's a, a rotary knob, you know, with no notches on it as such, you don't necessarily know what you've got. Or maybe you do. It just depends. It is unruly. There's a whole load of uncertainty in here, which could possibly be disconcerting if you're used to a very ordered and controlled synthesizer experience. But that is really not what this is. <laughs> it's a place where you start to conduct, you start to push stuff around, and then one of your one of your musicians just goes off and does a bit of a jazz solo and then it all comes back together and then it goes off again. It's brilliant at that. It's brilliant at discovery. It's brilliant at pushing you into places where you don't really know what it is that you're doing. And that can be quite alarming, but it's also a beautiful place of creativity. Of course, are you ever going to find that sound again? Oh, who knows? And is that important? No, probably not. Because every time you sit down with it, if you're going to use this in a larger setup or in a larger project, you're just going to keep on discovering stuff and find that you can use it all over the place. I mean, by itself, I don't think I've ever found a monosynth which is so much fun on its own. You know, everything else wants to connect to other stuff, you know, add it to this. But, you know, use that as a baseline and then have other stuff going on. But with this, you just play and play and play. I mean, I've talked about it before with, with monosynths in the, oh, look, you've got a monosynth and it just makes one noise at a time. Oh, all right, it's got a sequencer or an arpeggiator or something, so you can have a bit of fun. But ultimately, you're just crafting one noise. You seem to be crafting half a dozen noises with this all the time. <laughs> and there's something else going on. And then there's a bleepy thing up here. And then there's a, oh, you bring that sub back in and that's going, ooh, 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 down here. And then you play with that weird internal patching knob and it just wanders off somewhere else. What an extraordinary device. Extraordinary. So if I was to sum up the experience in a couple of words, I wouldn't really know where to start. I mean, it's exciting, it's surprising, it's unexpected. It's this huge stereo sound of farty, thick, treacly analog sounds from which you can tease noise, you can tease percussion sounds, rhythms, and all sorts of heartbeats and stuff going on here because of the way the sequencer changes stuff. And then with a bit more massaging, you can tease out these really nice little twinkly tones. Yeah, there's a heck of a lot to explore in here. So that's enough for now. I think I gotta send this back. Sadly, Angog Solutions wants it back so that they can take it around other places and let other people have a go on it, which is fair enough. But I've thoroughly enjoyed having a little bit of time to play on this. And I'll be forever grateful to Tom at Analog Solutions for sending it to me just to try out. So there you are, Analog Solutions Impulse Command. So there you go, the impulse command. It's a big flipping synth. It'll cost you about a grand and it's probably worth every penny. Right, I better go off and do some much less interesting things. And in the meantime, go and make some tunes. <laughs>